Good evening, dear doctors. It's my pleasure to host our new clinical education session on XP Connect webinar series powered by Logic General Imaging Ultrasound Technology from GE Healthcare. Today, we have Dr. Ankit Shah as the faculty of the session. Dr. Shah's session will be on ultrasound imaging in inflammatory arthropathies. Dr. Ankit Shah is a consultant radiologist in Grayscale Imaging, KLS Memorial Hospital, Mumbai. Dr. Shah has a vast experience in the field of radiology and his subspecialty lies in MSK imaging, emergency radiology, and non-vascular interventions. Dr. Ankit has many publications to his credit and has presented his paper to the International Skeletal Society in Vancouver. Without further ado, I welcome Dr. Ankit Shah to conduct this exciting and informative session. All right. Uh, at the outset, let me thank GE for inviting me to talk on this, uh, you know, quarantine content, this ultrasound imaging and inflammatory arthropathies. So uh, this topic has been quite close to me. And, uh, you know, uh, let's see if I can do justice to this in such a short span of time. All right, starting off straight. So there are key words that I would like you all to remember. But this is for people, you know, who are not doing much of musculoskeletal, uh, not ultrasound, musculoskeletal imaging at all. So uh, let me start with what is synovium. It's uh, an inner lining of all the synovial joint spaces. Uh, it lines the tendon sheaths and bursae. So in any inflammatory arthropathy, irrespective of the nature of arthropathy, is it rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthropathy, spondylo arthropathy, what happens is the synovium gets inflamed and then it causes gradual uh, corrosion of the articular cartilage and uh, causes further causes erosions and ultimately it results in joint damage and ultimately leading to osteoarthritis. The next concept that we need to know is enthesis. These entheses are, are areas where the, actually the hard and soft tissues meet, wherein the ligament attaches to the bone, uh, where the tendon attaches to the bone or the joint capsule or the fascia which attaches to the bone. So uh, a lot of people must be familiar with this x-ray. This is the uh, this is the calcaneum that we see over here, and we see this uh, Achilles tendon silhouette coming and attaching over the bone. Uh, this is, uh, you know, whenever uh, we want to evaluate this area, we see an osseous projection, we call it an osseous spur or a calcaneal spur. So let me tell you that this is this area, okay, where the Achilles tendon goes and attaches over the bone, or this is the long axis image on ultrasound where we see the Achilles tendon and coming and attaching over this bony area. So this is actually known as enthesis. So apart from this, there are many different entheses in the body, you know, wherever your ligaments attach to the bone or, you know, for that matter, your supraspinatus tendon attaches to the greater tuberosity and so on. But uh, as far as this lecture goes, this much of information should be good enough. Now this, why are we talking about enthesis is that, uh, you know, enthesis forms uh, the basic, uh, uh, you know, imaging structure for reference when we're looking for spondyloarthropathies or the psoriasis, because that's where ultrasound uh, or, you know, these areas are primarily affected in these uh, disease conditions. Now we're, we're talking about inflammatory joint disorders. Uh, let me tell you that, you know, out of these, you know, there are just a, there are at least another 150 of these inflammatory arthritis, but in day-to-day -day practice uh, with regards to the rheumatologist, you know, the orthopedic surgeon or the general physician, there are a handful of these which we, which they see in day-to-day -day practice. So this is uh, crystal-induced arthritis, which is quite common, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, spondyloarthropathies, including psoriatic arthritis, uh, reactive arthritis, Enteropathic arthritis is seen in patients with, uh, uh, you know, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease and so on. And the other thing is ankylosing spondylitis. Although ankylosing spondylitis is primarily imaged on MR because, you know, the, uh, the pathological changes in the spine and the sacroiliac joints are much uh, better seen on MR. However, is when the peripheral uh, skeleton is involved, that's where we uh, get to see a lot of stuff on ultrasound. So we already have MR, why bother with ultrasound, all right? So uh, so some of my favorite uh, reasons is, one is the non-invasiveness, you really don't have to give contrast. Uh, you can have uh, multi-planar imaging, you can do multiple uh, uh, joints in one sitting, I mean, I can do the wrist, I can do the metacarpophalangeal joint. Uh, you know, when you're treating rheumatoid arthritis or for, uh, you know, any other inflammatory arthropathy, what the doctor wants to know is, you know, after giving the medications, is 
there a reduction in the in, uh, joint inflammation or in the synovium. So that's why repeatability is extremely important. High patient acceptance. Uh, imagine putting a small kid in, a, in an MRI just to see whether he or she has got some joint effusion or not. And of course, the most important thing nowadays is injection guidance. So whenever you want to give any kind of an intervention, inject a steroid, aspiration, that's where ultrasound is extremely useful. So what we see over here is this is the MR, we see an actual section. And this is a long axis of a metacarpophalangeal joint where we see joint erosions and a lot of vascularity on power Doppler. Uh, so uh, that's where, and one more important aspect while imaging small joints is, you know, not a lot of people know this, but the resolution of ultrasound is far, far, uh, you know, better than that of an, a standard MR, which would go almost at, uh, as high as three times of uh, the resolution of MR. So with this, uh, let's start, you know, uh, you know, most of us, we have uh, high frequency linear probes and ideally musculoskeletal ultrasound, you know, when we're talking about uh, ankle, hands, uh, 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 feet, you know, or elbow, we would want a high frequency linear probe, which goes into the range of 12 to 17 megahertz. However, it is these hockey stick transducers, you know, extremely high resolution, which goes almost a high resolution up to 18 megahertz, 20 megahertz, which have been the real game changers in rheumatology. And of course, sometimes, uh, you know, when I want to, uh, uh, you know, look at, uh, you know, these minute details, like, you know, small ligament calcifications, mild vascularity within the panis, that's when these uh, linear probes or uh, these hockey stick probes are absolutely essential. So when I want to look at the deeper structures, you know, for instance, uh, look at the hip joint or, you know, sometimes, uh, yeah, you know, look at a shoulder in an obese person, that's when, you know, I might also need a convex probe. So it's not that, you know, I'm not going to use a convex probe at all. In fact, you know, when I want to do some kind of an uh, uh, intervention, whether, you know, whether I want to inject in a sacroiliac -like joint or not, that's when, you know, these convex probes are also quite handy. So moving on. Um, one thing that I would really, really stress on that, you know, if there's one thing that you want to take home from this talk is I would really like you guys to go and adjust your machine settings. Because when we were doing uh, rheumatologic imaging, we want our power Doppler to be top notch. All right. Because that's going to be an essential component of the imaging. Because after I see something on grayscale, next thing I'm going to do is switch on my power Doppler. So, I would uh, encourage you guys to adjust your uh, PRF of power Doppler between 1.3 to 1.5 kilohertz, because when you look at 0 0.1 kilohertz, you know, it's, there's a lot of spotty, uh, uh, you know, signals, it's bleeding everywhere. Uh, if you put on five kilohertz, these low flow, uh, you know, blood signals, which will really get suppressed. So we have to find a sweet spot in between, which is a recommended between 1.3 to 1.5 kilohertz. So once you set your PRF to a particular level, you have to set your filters and your filters should be set for a low velocity flow. And then you adjust the color gain. So what you do is you really turn on the color gain where let all the bleeding of the color happen and then gradually shift it down so that, you know, you get flow only within the desired area of interest, which is your synovium or, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the periarticular vessels. So, uh, one more thing what uh, GE has is, you know, what I use day in and day out. In fact, it has almost replaced uh, power Doppler is HD flow. Now, this is something, uh, this is a new uh, technology which uses, it's extremely sensitive to low level flows. And it also shows me bidirectional flow of the blood vessels. So what we see over here is this is a case of tenosynovitis where there's a tendon. You see joint effusion, uh, you see effusion within the tendon sheath. But over here, this is a synovium. What I do is I just switch on the power Doppler uh, or the HD flow, and this is what you get uh, intense vascularity over here. So once I see this vascularity, I know that I'm actually dealing with an active synovium over here. So that's where these newer technologies, this like HD flow are extremely, they're, they're actually much better than the conventional power Doppler. So uh, uh, this is some real good stuff, which is there in rheumatology. So uh, how do we do it better? So, uh, you know, focusing a little bit on the techniques. So what we do is, you know, you give some light pressure. Don't use too much of pressure when you're evaluating superficial structures. 
use copious amounts of gel or a water bath so that you know there's a little bit of distance between the probe and the skin that you're Im uh, imaging. So if you see over here, this is an anterior aspect of the knee. What we're seeing over here is, you know, when I give a lot of pressure, uh, you know, this fluid just dissipates away. And, you know, I'm, if there's some effusion over here, I would have completely missed it. So give a little bit, uh, you know, give light pressure. One more thing, suppose you don't have a really high resolution, you know, linear probe like an ML615 or a hockey stick. This is where, you know, a large amount of copious gel can be handy. You use a lot of gel or something absolutely simple just put the hand in, or, uh, you know, hand or the foot that you're imaging. You put it inside a water bath and put right the, uh, the probe on it. And trust me, uh, you know, it works absolutely fine. No problem with that. And you'll get fantastic images. So what is the checklist? What are the structures that we look for? So the first and first that we look for, we look at the synovial recess. So this is a long axis of the hip joint. This is the acetabulum. This is uh, the femoral head and neck. We look at the synovial recess. All right. First thing when I uh, when I'm evaluating for um, an inflammatory arthropathy, I want to see is there any effusion within the joint. So I should know what are the common recesses to look like uh, to look for. So the hip joint is the anterior recess. Uh, I want want to look for fluid, simple, complex, or apart from the fluid is a synovial hypertrophy as well. Next thing what I look for is the articular cartilage. Yes, uh, hip is not a very great joint uh, to look for articular cartilage on ultrasound. However, when I'm looking at a follow-up case or, you know, when I'm looking at a pediatric case, uh, you know, whatever little that amount of this hypoechoic cartilage that I can see, I would want to go for it and comment on it. After that, what I look for is this bone profile. The bone profile is, see if, uh, is seen as a homogeneous, discontinuous, uh, discontinuous structure that we see over here, nicely echogenic that we see over here. However, in kids, you watch out for the epiphysis because they will be seen as a, as a discontinuity um, at the uh, junction of the femoral uh, head, uh, head and neck. So be uh, careful of that. Next thing, uh, what I would want to look for is a tendon. So this is the ileus uh, psoas muscle belly. This is the tendon that comes over here. So you look at the tendons, you look at the tendon sheets. Um, you look at the ligaments and the joint capsule. For instance, over here, there's no separate joint capsule. What we see is the iliofemoral ligament along with the hip joint capsule. Everything is merged together. And as it goes and attaches over the bone, remember I spoke about the enthesis concept. So even as it goes and attaches over the femur, it's absolutely smooth over here. Next thing what I look for is muscle. Uh, it's really nice and, uh, 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 you know, homogeneous echo texture that we see. Uh, we look at nerves and vessels wherever required. So suppose, suppose if there's an, uh, this synovite is causing nerve compression, that's when we look at the neurovascular bundle as well. And, you know, there's something that, uh, we, uh, I would really like to see while evaluating is a subcutaneous tissue. So one thing is, you know, I would li like to look for if there's edema over there, because if there's edema, I would think about intense inflammation or if there are any nodules or anything, then it will give me an added diagnostic value. So, uh, you know, when the patient comes to you, something like this, all right, you know, this patient was a known case of uh, rheumatoid arthritis for several years. And now the patient has been sent to me for, uh, ultrasound evaluation. So what does a rheumatologist looking for uh, in your report? First thing they want to know is a synovitis. That means if they've been treating the patient, is the medication good enough? Do they need to change the medication? Do, do, do they need to increase or taper? What more? Uh, it's a tenosynovitis. So this swelling that we see over here, is this only the joint effusion or is this swelling because of tenosynovitis? You would want to know because if there's tenosynovitis, it's going to be a bad sign for the tendon. It might result in tendon damage. Are the imaging findings in this patient indicative of further disease progression? Now, there are certain imaging findings, uh, you know, that we'll be seeing uh, as we move along in the presentation that tell us that, you know what, you know, maybe this disease will progress further unless we really step up the uh, the treatment plan, you know, we change the medication, we step up the treatment plan. If uh, there's an alternative medication that we need to give, got to think about that. Are there bone erosions? Now, this bone erosions, you know, new erosions or stable erosions, this, these are an important prognostic fa uh, prognostication factors. Is there a differential diagnosis? All right, right. you know what, this patient has uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Am I looking at possible tuberculosis over here or am I dealing with 
um, uh, uh, like, you know, uh, uh, a neuropathic joint. So there are things that they would want to know about that. Um, and another, the most important thing is, is the patient in remission, which means that, okay, I've been treating this patient. Uh, do you think there's, uh, you know, the patient, we need to discontinue the medications and uh, maybe, you know, there's no active inflammation. Should we start with something else or should I refer this patient to an orthopedic surgeon for a surgical management if required? So these are the things they would be wanting uh, to know from your scan. So uh, what can ultrasound show? So if you know what can ultrasound show, this imaging in rheumatoid arthritis or inflammatory arthropathies is going to be a piece of cake, all right? So there's simple things, joint effusion, they would, uh, ultrasound can show synovitis, which is synovial thickening, uh, bursitis, when, uh, so these are all these structures which are lined by synovium. Tendon pathologies, which is going to be tenosynovitis, uh, tendinosis, and tendon tears. You know, so tendinosis progress to tendon tears. So what we see over here, this is tenosynovitis in the long axis. This is an extensor tendon. What we see, there's a nice normal tendon, and we see fluid within the tendon sheath. This is anechoic fluid. Another patient uh, with an inflammatory arthropathy, what we see is this is the wrist joint uh, in the long axis, and we see some amount of synovial hypertrophy with active panis in the uh, intercarpal joint recess. Another patient with, uh, 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 with known case of uh, ankylosing spondylitis, he came with swelling over the foot. So what we see is synovial thickening uh, over here and some amount of hyperemia at the periphery. So what we've seen is synovial hypertrophy, we've seen tenosynovitis, and furthermore, so we've talked about uh, soft tissue inflammation. Now let's talk about what, the, what does chronic soft tissue inflammation progress to? So that progresses through cartilaginous or osseous or osteochondral lesions. Uh, so what we see over here, this is a transverse image of the metacarpal head. What we see, that smooth cortex of the bone that's lost, you see dip over here. You see a lot of irregularity over here. So this open arrow shows synovial hypertrophy, whereas this shows a cortical erosion. We spoke about enthesopathy. So basically, in enthesopathic changes, what we see is, uh, uh, you know, we, you see thickening of the tendon. You will see uh, hyperemia. You will see calcifications, cortical irregularity at the attachment of the soft tissues. Uh, so because of all these, uh, you know, structural damage that is happening or soft tissue inflammation, the normal structures might also get involved. So what we're talking about compression neuropathy. So this is a, a transverse section of the level of the carpal, uh, a, a carpal tunnel. What we see is that this is synovial hypertrophy within the flexor tendon sheath. These are the flexor tendons. And over here, this is compression happening of the median nerve. So uh, this patient typically presented with, uh, you know, carpal tunnel syndrome. Uh, the patient was already being treated for uh, uh, for rheumatoid arthritis. So, uh, uh, you, you know, before going in for the surgical treatment, they would always want to step up the medications and see if the patient settles down with that. A lot of patients uh, require, you know, with chronic inflammatory arthropathies, rheumatoid arthritis, or ankylosing spondylitis, they, they undergo surgeries for, you know, arthroplasties, joint, uh, or, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, insufficiency fractures and all. So even after all that, you know, uh, uh, you know, the disease comes back and then again that imaging can be a problem because of metallic implants. That's where ultrasound is fantastic. So uh, let me tell you, so this was a patient with rheumatoid arthritis operated for bilateral insufficiency fractures. So in spite of these metallic implants, we can see that there is recurrence of uh, synovial uh, 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 panis over here. Power Doppler shows a lot of hyperemia over here, and this uh, showed disease recurrence. So this is where, uh, you know, ultrasound is extremely helpful. You don't have to ask the patient to undergo an MR, and uh, ultrasound uh, and metallic implants don't cause a problem at all while imaging in inflammatory arthritis. So uh, when we're talking about soft tissue inflammation, I'm going to talk about synovitis, tenosynovitis, bursitis, enthesitis. And when I talk about st structural damage, uh, what I'm talking about is erosions, joint space narrowing, and tendon rupture. If you know this slide, you're done. You're settled. I, I mean, uh, you know, there's uh, uh, once you know to look for these uh, structures or these concepts that you know, your imaging in uh, inflammatory arthropathies is going to be a piece of cake. 
So let's start with soft tissue inflammation. Uh, so before I start with this, I would like to tell you guys something about the OMARAC, uh, you know, system, which is, you know, uh, there was a body which was constituted in 1992 where they had outcome measures in, uh, uh, in, in rheumatology. So there was a group, all right. So what they tried to do is they try to standardize, um, uh, you know, imaging terms or imaging in ultrasound and rheumatology. So that what happens is, uh, there is the least amount of inter-observer, uh, uh, you know, variations. So that maybe I scan, you scan, uh, uh, you know, we use the same terminology over here uh, 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 while describing what is synovial hypertrophy, giant of effusion, a small bone erosion or large bone erosion. So that it's it, it pretty much, uh, you know, works for the, for the patient. So suppose if the patient has come to me today, it goes uh, to somebody else tomorrow. Uh, you know, at least uh, we know that we're talking, uh, we're imaging on uh, 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 using the same terminology. So, uh, so all that was started in 1992. So over the years, there has been, uh, you know, a, a lot of changes in the definitions as well, and it keeps on improving and they keep on modifying. So it's good to know about this OMARAC definition. So they have clear cut definitions for joint effusion, synovial hypertrophy, tenosynovitis. So it's good to know this. All right. So while imaging, uh, you know, keep these in mind. So when they, we are talking about joint effusion, it's any abnormal intraarticular material, which is anechoic or hypoechoic compared with the subcutaneous fat, and it is uh, displaceable or compressible. And of course, it does not exhibit Doppler signal. All right. So what we see over here is there's some effusion uh, within the suprapatellar recess. That's a patella. That's a pre-suprapatellar uh, fat, pre-femoral fat. And this is effusion. It is anechoic. Obviously, uh, uh, it is less echogenic than the subcutaneous fat. All right. And it is displaceable and compressible. So coming to this previous, uh, uh, you know, in one of the previous slides, I said that, you know, once I see, I would like to compress and see what's happening to the, this thing. So uh, coming to synovitis, uh, it is defined as intraarticular uh, tissue that is typically hypoechoic compared with subcutaneous fat, and that is non-displaceable and poorly compressible. All right. So uh, differentiation between effusion and synovitis is, uh, you know, effusion can be completely uh, displaced and compressed, whereas the synovial hypertrophy can be uh, uh, is non-compressible. So what we see over here is. And this, uh, this is the metacarpophalangeal joint. This is the metacarpal. Uh, you see synovial tissue, which goes all the way along the dorsum. You see this anechoic little bit amount of fluid also that we see over here. And of course, when we put on power Doppler, we see synovial hyperemia within the, uh, within the joint. Okay. So this is where it's going to be useful. So lack of compressibility. All right. So every time you come to a joint, make sure that you give a little bit of pressure. So this was a patient with synovial hypertrophy in the suprapatellar recess. When you give compression, if you see that the effusion is completely compressed, but the synovial hypertrophy, it remains more or less the same and it's partially displayed. So I know that I'm dealing with synovial hypertrophy over here and it's not just simple effusion. Um, so how do we go about it? So any intraarticular soft tissue that I see. So, okay. So when I look at this, maybe this is complex fluid. This could be uh, an anechoic collection as well. So how do I differentiate? What I do is, is it anechoic and compressible? Uh, then it's going to be simple fluid. However, if it's neither of these, what can happen? Okay, I see this, uh, but there's no hyperemia. Is it compressible? If compressible, yes, then it's complex fluid. If it is non-compressible and it still shows hyperemia, then it goes in favor of synovitis. So this patient was a patient uh, with... Uh, 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 with gout. So uh, what we see over here, the synovial hypertrophy that we see, this is the articular cartilage over here. So ap apart from that, once we've seen the synovitis on grayscale, what we do, next thing is we switch on our Doppler signal. So whenever we look at Doppler signal, uh, you know, there is a grading system or a, uh, uh, which has been uh, developed by the OMARAC, which will help us tell that, you know, how, what is the degree of inflammation? Because, you know, if the patient is going to take the treatment and is going to come back for a follow-up scan, you would want to know whether, uh, what is the degree of, uh, you know, vascularity within the panis. So in grade zero that we see over here, there's absolutely no vascularity within the synovium. So there's no flow in the synovium. So, so this would point more towards, 
a fibrous panus. Grade one, uh, where you get up to three spot signals, all right? So you see one spot signal over here, but maybe you might see three spot signals or up to two confluent spot signals uh, or one confluent spot signal or up to two single spots, all right? So very tiny spots, if you see, that would come up to grade one. This is grade two, which is definitely more than the uh, two or three spots that he spoke in grade one. So this typically involves less than uh, half the area of the uh, uh, total area of the synovium. So this entire synovium is there, but then the vascularity which we see over here is less than 50%. And grade three, which is a maximum that we see, in, involves more than half the area of the synovium. And this is what grade three vascularity looks like. So um, the uh, the target uh, uh, or the goal for the rheumatologist is that, you know, if the patient comes with grade three, you start on DMAR drugs or whatever, uh, you know, drugs they're beginning with, uh, they would want to bring down the vascularity to as close to grade zero as possible before discontinuing the drugs. So um, where to look? So unfortunately, there still aren't, you know, any consensus on how many joints to look at. Uh, when you look at this table, you might really uh, go crazy, you know, if you're not used to doing, uh, you know, imaging in rheumatology. So every study has shown their own, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, they propose their own number of joints that, you know, elbow, wrist, metacarpals, 12 joints, 7 joints, 18 joints, it goes to as high as 28 joints. But uh, in real life, it really doesn't work that way. So uh, I'll come to that a bit later. So don't break your head over this uh, table. This is just for information that, you know, uh, so certain people really scan so many joints or maybe it's man, uh, it's required to pick up those early uh, rheumatoid arthritis patients. So uh, going through a lot of literature, the most common consensus is what we do is we divide the, uh, the rheumatoid arthritis into early disease and established disease. So early disease is maybe uh, preclinical. So what they see, say is, you know, you either you scan second and fifth metacarpophalangeal joints uh, and you scan the fifth metatarsophalangeal joints. So, all right, so if uh, there's a patient who's suspected of rheumatoid arthritis but no other clinical symptoms, maybe then, you know, it'll be just enough looking at the, these MCP joints and the fifth metatarsophalangeal joint. So over here, what we see is there's some synovium and some hyperemia and power Doppler. What they say is, you know, avoid the first metatarsophalangeal joint, which is your great toe, all right? Because uh, the great toe uh, is inherent for, uh, for you know, a lot of osteoarthritis. You will have hallux valgus and all those problems. And, of course, it's one of the most uh, common sites for gout. So those might be very confounding factors. And so what else do we look for in the established disease? Now, this is where things get really crazy, all right? So this is the... Middle finger, uh, metacarpophalangeal joint, we see a lot of erosions, uh, synovial hypertrophy with uh, hyperemia over here. So this is clearly an established disease. So they say, so if you want to look, if the patient is in remission, that means there's complete loss of activity within the uh, synovium, you scan all the joints from second to fifth metacarpophalangeal joints, you scan the entire wrist joints, and you scan all the second to fifth metatarsophalangeal joints. All right, so you know, it actually adds up to 44 joints and uh, uh, it doesn't really work out, you know, it, it's not that difficult, okay? So uh, let me tell you what happens in day-to-day -day life. So uh, 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 so before this, you know, if you see, uh, look at the literature in rheumatoid arthritis, most of the studies have concentrated on hands, uh, uh, hands and wrists. So why? Why is that so? So one thing is, you know, you have a lot of joints in that one small area, all right? So you have... Uh, bones, synovial surfaces, you have the air, uh, you have metacarpophalangeal joints, centrophalangeal joints. So a lot of places in one area. So it's easier to scan and extremely superficial. And they've done whole body MR scans just to see, and they found out that the activity in hands and feet, for that matter, there's a reasonable surrogate for the total synovitis burden in the body. All right. So that, uh, so it gives you an idea of what else is happening all throughout the body. And uh, the best thing is, you know, erosions are extremely easy to detect in smaller bones. So that's where, uh, you know, uh, ultrasound scanning of hands and wrists is extremely important in rheumatoid arthritis. So if you see in this uh, uh, in, in this uh, presentation, a lot of images which I've shown are from the wrist as well as hand and feet. So um, 
in real life when the patient is referred to you maybe uh, the rheumatologist or the orthopedic surgeon or the medicine guy they will say all right you know what this patient is known case of rheumatoid arthritis or maybe this patient is diabetic she just come with uh, uh, with uh, pain in the shoulder will you scan the shoulder will you scan the hip will you scan the knee so it's uh, unless you know you uh, are, are closely working with a rheumatologist and you know you guys have developed certain protocols then only maybe you would be expected to scan the entire uh, you know both ankle both wrists both feet and so on so it's important to sit with uh, your rheumatologist or this medicine guy to sit and focus on what you would want to look for so suppose if the show uh, you have a patient with shoulder where do you look for synovitis you look for in the posterior joint recess all right so between the glenoid and the humerus go posteriorly and look for uh, a synovitis or joint effusion the posterior joint recess when we are talking about the elbow uh, uh, the easiest places to look for joint effusion would be in the anterior uh, joint recess. So this is a humerus, this is an anterior fat pad. You see some joint effusion with synovial hypertrophy. And in the posteriorly, what we see is this is the olecranon fossa of the humerus. You see effusion and there's anterior displacement of the posterior fat pad. And there's a little bit of synovial hypertrophy, all right? The shoulder, elbow, these uh, areas are a little bit easier to scan. So, uh, you know, coming back to wrist and uh, hand, all right, so if you have a patient with wrist, where do you look for? You look for the dorsal as well as the volar recesses. So when we're talking about dorsal uh, recesses, uh, so this uh, this is a radius and the pr uh, proximal carpal row, which is your, the lunate over here. And between the lunate and the, uh, and the capitate, you have the distal car uh, carpal row. So if you have to take one good image of the wrist, uh, of the dorsum of the wrist, this is what you should try and include. You should include the radius, lunate, and the capitate, uh, a, a capitate in one row, and try and get this kind of an image to uh, to uh, to get the standard views, which is accepted by EULA. And so, what we see: hypoechoic intraarticular soft tissue with bulging of the joint capsule. Another place that uh, is recommended is also to have a look at the uh, uh, at the volar res recesses. This might be a little bit uh, difficult to see, but however. Uh, you know, if if there's a suspicion, you should have a look. That's when, you know, it, it, it'll be great if you kind of, you know, use a slightly lower frequency transducer or you drop your frequency because it's going to be deep to your flexor tendons and make sure that you drop the frequency because an extremely high frequency, maybe, you know, that 18 megahertz, your acoustic probe, you might not get this kind of a penetration. So do that. Um, again, uh, you know, when we're looking at the fingers, either your metacarpophalangeal joint, uh, proximal interphalangeal, distal interphalangeal joint, make sure that you see the volar aspect, uh, uh, the dorsal recesses, which are extremely uh, easy to have a look at, or you also have a look at the volar recesses. So what we see is this is a, uh, uh, this is a inter uh, proximal interphalangeal joint. What we see, this is the flexor tendon, this is a volar plate, and this is a volar joint recess, all right? So you have to remember that your joint effusion is deep to the uh, volar plate uh, or the volar uh, recess lies deep to the volar plate over here. So uh, you might be really thinking that, uh, you know, I mean, you already said about these recesses. Uh, what about the anatomy? I mean, I, I'm really not used to it. So what I'm trying to do is, you know, I'm just going to brush up a little bit of anatomy about the recesses of the wrist as well as the fingers because these are the most commonly scanned joints all right rest of them maybe you'll just have to read up a bit but uh, it's uh, doable all right it's not that tough uh, so let, let's go ahead with it so you know we'll identify our uh, uh, our bony contours this is how i place the probe so you use the radius the lunate and the capitate as a markers uh, as a osseous margins over here so this is what we see over here this is your uh, radiocarpal joint over here and this distally what you see is the intercarpal joint space so this is what it looks on the ct image so what this is the similar image that we've tried to recreate on ultrasound so if you should take this image this is a very satisfying image that you take and at least you made sure that you've seen seen the wrist adequately and of course the, uh, you also have to screen from uh, the entire sweep the entire wrist from radial to ulnar aspect so coming to synovial recesses of the fingers. So you remember I was talking about the dorsal recess and the volar recess. So there are certain concepts that you need to know. So this is your X-ray of the finger that we've taken. I thought it's easier to demonstrate on this. So what we see is this is this entire joint cavity that we see over here. All right. So this is the volar recess. This is 
uh, 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 this is the articulation and this is the dorsal recess of the metacarpophalangeal joint. So you have to know that it really, uh, the joint space doesn't end over here. It goes all the way back to the metaphysis, okay? And uh, make sure that you scan this area. This is the neck. Don't mistake this as a uh, 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 as an erosion of the metacarpal head. Again, as you go down, this is the volar recess, goes quite volar, and this is the dorsal recess of the proximal interphalangeal joint as well as the distal interphalangeal joint. And these are the volar plates. So make sure you have a look deep to the volar plates. And this is just a blown up image just to get a better appreciation of what I was talking. Volar plate, volar joint recess, and this is a dorsal joint recess that we see. How, okay, now that we're back from our uh, nice concept diagrams, how does it look on ultrasound? So that's a metacarpal head, smooth bone cortex, hypoechoic cartilage that we see over here. Uh, this is this intraarticular fat, and this is this uh, overlying extensor tendon. And this is actually your dorsal uh, recess, which goes all the way back, all the way back, and all the way back over here, all right? So make sure you, s you screen the entire uh, dorsal recess of the metacarpo, uh, metacarpophalangeal joint. Where else to look? Anterior uh, joint recess in the hip. That's absolutely, uh, you know, a lot of us have been doing pediatric hips. So, uh, uh, you know, this is not a new concept that we're looking at. This is the nice uh, uh, smooth cortex of the femoral neck. And this is some synovial hypertrophy that we see. Thickened synovium, mild hyperemia within the thickened synovium. So this was uh, a patient with synovitis of the hip. Uh, the etiology was not known, but then uh, uh, nothing else that uh, there's no turbidity of the fluid uh, to suggest, uh, you know, any obvious infection at this point of time. Um, so in the knee, what do we look at? So this is, uh, you know, we look at two recesses commonly, the suprapatellar and the parapatellar recesses. So this is a, a transverse view of the suprapatellar recess. This is a quadriceps, that's a fever. You see joint effusion along with nodular synovium over here. So this is synovial hypertrophy that we see. So we've identified synovial thickening. This is another patient with uh, GIA. This is a pediatric patient. If you look at this, that's the epiphysis, that's a metaphysis. Uh, you know, when we're talking about pediatric, please don't mistake these, uh, you know, unossified epiphysis as synovial hypertrophy or joint effusion. So this is what we're talking about in the suprapatellar recess. This is a thickened synovium. And if you put on power Doppler, this is a little bit of vascularity that is seen. Um, another patient with uh, uh, with uh, GIA. So what we see uh, is uh, the, this is the tibia metaphysis. This is uh, the epiphysis over here. You see the distended anterior tibiotalar joint recess. This is an echoic joint uh, effusion along with synovial hypertrophy. And when we have a look at it on the transverse axis, uh, on the short axis, you see a lot of thickening. Okay, so ankle focus on the anterior tibiotalar joint recess. And just like the hands, uh, uh, you know, the foot is, you know, although the anatomy, anatomy is quite complicated, you know, it's extremely easy to, uh, you know, visualize the joint spaces uh, because the dorsal recesses are quite uh, obvious, you know, especially when there's synovial hypertrophy or joint effusion. So uh, this is the dorsal recess of the midfoot joints, and this is the metatarsophalangeal joint. This is the synovial thickening along with power Doppler that we see. And if you look at it closely, there's a little bit of disruption of the uh, smooth cortical margin compared to what we see over here. So there are these small erosions that we see. So this patient had uh, rheumatoid arthritis as well, whereas the patient over here on the left, uh, she had uh, HLA-B27 positive. All right, so now that we're done with uh, synovitis of the joints, coming to tenosynovitis, according to Omorak, it is defined as hypoechoic or anechoic thickened tissue within a tendon sheath. So, uh, you know, that might be anechoic or echogenic, uh, you know, it doesn't matter. And it should be seen in two perpendicular planes. Uh, and it sh may show or may not show, uh, you know, a Doppler signal. So what, uh, this is one case, uh, you know, on top, what we see is multiple tendons. And you see uh, effusion within the tendon sheath, predominantly effusion and a little bit of synovial thickening. So this is tenosynovitis. There's another case, uh, you know, this patient was known to have rheumatoid arthritis with a lot of nodular synovial tissue. So this is what, uh, and these are uh, uh, two different cases with two different uh, kinds of appearances that we see. 
And uh, one more thing that uh, we should know that, you know, extensor copy ulnar wrist tendon sheath is most commonly involved in RA. Uh, so maybe one uh, between one and six years duration. But, uh, you know, if you have to scan that area, you got to take a closer look at ECU tendon sheath. So this was a patient with uh, rheumatoid arthritis. You see that extensor carpi ulnaris uh, tendon. Uh, you see hypoechoic soft tissue over here on the short axis. Uh, the cortex looks quite smooth, cortex of the ulna. And when you put on power Doppler, there's a lot of hyperemia that we see in the thick and soft tissue. And this is what synovium looks like. You know, this patient was operated, synovectomy was done. And this is what the extensive synovium looks like. Another, pa another patient with hyperuricemia, uh, you know, uh, so she was just, she just presented one day with a severe pain along the volar, pain and swelling along the volar aspect of the finger, inability to extend. So what we see is we see the normal flexor tendon of the finger, this is a, uh, the, the proximal interphalangeal joint, and all that we see is uh, simple fluid within the tendon sheath. Uh, how is this hyperuricemia? It's not that you diagnose an ultrasound. It's just that, you know, once you get a follow-up from the orthopedic surgeon or the medicine guy that, oh, you know what, uh, she has no other history. It's just that we did her uric acid levels and it was quite, uh, uh, quite uh, elevated, and maybe it, she fits into that. All right. So a lot of times, you know, as a radiologist, you might just say, okay, you know, this is phenocyanomitis, simple effusion, and uh, or there's a lot of synovial hypertrophy. That's all that you uh, need to diagnose. That's pretty much all that you can do. Um, coming to enthesitis. So enthesitis is defined as enthesial thickening. All right. That, remember that Achilles tendon, it goes and where it attaches. So you'll have thickening of that uh, a, a soft tissue, which is attaching to the bone hypoechogenicity, and there should be a Doppler signal. And there are these other markers, which, you know, you might be able to see irregularity of the bone as well, maybe calcification as well. So this was proximal iliotibial band attachment. What we see is that this is a normal iliotibial band, but as it comes over the proximal attachment, it becomes thickened and hypoechoic. And when we put on Doppler, it shows a lot of uh, signal as well. So it just goes in fro uh, favor of uh, enthesitis. Um, this is this Achilles tendon attachment uh, over the calcaneum. Remember that, uh, you know, one of those first or second slides, which I had shown you, that nice pristine tendon, which goes and attaches over the calcaneum. Now, this area, if you look at it, uh, there's a lot of uh, irregularity of the bone. There is hypoechoic uh, uh, appearance in the perinsertional fibers. You see a lot of vascularity over here, and maybe some amount of a few interstitial tears might be present. So these are the hallmarks of enthesitis that uh, you might uh, be expected to see. Um, another patient, she was a 47-year-old female uh, with painful swelling uh, along the middle finger. So what we see is over here, you see some thickening at the expected course of the collateral ligaments. So I thought that, uh, uh, you know, this is just simple crystal deposition disease. Uh, uh, so if you see that this is a collateral ligament thickened, hypoechoic, some amount of calcification, periarticular edema. You remember I spoke about looking at the subcutaneous tissues as well. And uh, some amount of uh, hyperemia on power Doppler images, you see some irregularities as well. So I thought initially when I scanned the patient that, you know, I gave the diagnosis as, as crystal deposition disease, but ultimately she turned out to have psoriasis. Uh, maybe somebody elicited the history of psoriasis and uh, that's how she got labeled as one. So there we stand corrected. Bursitis. Uh, so, uh, you know, virtually any anatomical bursa can be involved, but then the common ones that we see is the subacromial subdeltoid bursa, the retrocalcaneal bursa, and uh, the gastronemia semimembranosis bursa, which typically, you know, forms a baker cyst. So, what do you see in bursitis? Same, effusion, cyano hy synovial hypertrophy, or both. That synovial hypertrophy may or may not show, uh, uh, may not show hyperemia. So this is a retrocalcaneal bursa. You see thick, uh, uh, you know, complex uh, uh, tissue over here. So this is synovium and a lot of vascularity that we see on HD flow. This was a patient with a large Baker's cyst that we see going all the way down. He was a known case of rheumatoid arthritis. So this is a proximal tibia. And as it goes down, there's significant amount of synovial hypertrophy. Uh, there's some complex fluid, a little bit of more clear fluid as you go proximally. And uh, of course, when you put on power Doppler, there's a significant amount of hyperemia. So this is your classic Baker cyst, all right? It arises from the knee joint uh, and goes, tracks all the way down uh, over here. So 
We've already spoken about, uh, you know, soft tissue inflammation. Now let's talk about structural damage. So basically what we're talking about, uh, you know, cartilage loss, bone erosions, uh, joint space narrowing, and, uh, you know, tendon rupture. So what uh, what do we mean by cortical erosions? Or rather, what does OMARAC mean by cortical erosions? Is There has to be uh, a discontinuity of intra-articular bone cortex, which is visible in orthogonal planes, which means you have to scan the bone in a short axis as well as a long axis. All right, it should be seen in both the planes because sometimes it ha uh, it happens that you just have maybe small uh, nutrient foramina or something like that, which might be visible only in one plane and you might label it as uh, as an erosion, okay? So that's why it's important. So, uh, and when you look at uh, the literature, uh, you know, they say that uh, ultrasound is uh, almost 6.5 to 7 times more uh, 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 more sensitive in detecting early erosions compared uh, to that of plain x-rays. So if you look over here, a patient with rheumatoid arthritis, we see a lot of cortical irregularity over the metacarpal head. Remember, I, I, I uh, spoke to you about that. And you see that this distension of the joint capsule and it goes all the way proximally, almost right till the metaphysis over here. And this is synovial thickening. Another patient with uh, carpometacarpal joint arthritis, you see a lot of uh, erosions uh, over here in, along the articular surfaces. This is synovial hypertrophy and power Doppler when uh, it shows active inflammation that we see. Um, so just to show you, you know, what happens that if, if you, if the patient does not get treated, what happens? Of course, these are uh, separate cases, but just to show the, show you what happens. So this is one metacarpophalangeal joint. This is patient A, early inflammation. You see a nice cartilage over the metacarpal head, all right? This is some amount of joint effusion, uh, possible synovial hypertrophy, not sure, but this is an inflamed joint. You see the, uh, uh, see the cartilage pretty well. This is a patient with a little bit of advanced inflammatory arthritis. You don't see this uh, cartilage at all. This is synovial thickening. Uh, uh, no obvious uh, erosions uh, that we see as of now. And this is a third patient that we see that, you know, chronic inflammation, you see large thickening, thickened synovium. You see that there's remodeling of the bone and large geodes that we see. So this is how the progress happens. So if you want to uh, discuss or, uh, you know, a report on your uh, uh, on your ultrasound report you know how is the uh, bone erosion or maybe your uh, rheumatologist asks you okay you know what i want you to give me the size as well so uh, there is one scoring system by wakefield uh, which is more commonly used you know there are a lot of scoring system but this is something which is more commonly used so less than 2 mm is small 2 to 4 mm size are moderate erosions and more than 4 mm size are large erosions, all right? So on follow-up scans, maybe you remember which was a place you uh, uh, a place you measured, try and look for it, and uh, maybe you can report that as well. So we've spoken about small erosions, speaking about large erosions. One more thing before beginning uh, the scan is, please have a look at the x-rays, uh, you know, if patient isn't carrying, because the x-rays are going to give you far more, uh, uh, you know, a lot of information about the bone, uh, some, uh, so that, you know, you will be mentally ready for it. So suppose if I just start scanning this patient and thinking, all right, you know, there are these small erosion synovial hypertrophy, but look at the x-ray, what does it show? It shows that there's, uh, uh, you know, almost lysis of the lower end of, uh, of ulna, there's uh, huge geos that we see, loss of joint space, uh, uh, and a lot of articular destruction that we see over here. But similarly, on ultrasound, you see these large uh, erosions that we see. In fact, you see that the ulna has gone a little dorsal, so there's uh, dorsal subluxation, so there's instability of the wrist joint as well. And this is a synovial hypertrophy. So this is a fairly advanced case uh, of uh, rheumatoid arthritis. So joint space narrowing, all right, some of the purists might say that, oh, uh, how can you say joint space narrowing? There's nothing like joint space, all right, there is cartilage, there is joint fluid. But then, you know, this concept was uh, 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 was taken because, you know, a lot of times, uh, 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 you know, when people do whole body MR or something like that, it's uh, 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 MR with large FOVs, like, you know, both hands together or both wrists together, it's extremely difficult to look at uh, or the measure the size of the cartilage, the thickness of the cartilage. So um, they st uh, started using that, you know, that radiolucent cartilage, you know, whenever it gets corroded, there's reduction in the joint space. So this concept of joint space narrowing. So uh, what they say is, is 
the distance between the visible subchondral plate of two articulating bones is less than normal. So which, even if you don't see the cartilage, but if you feel that the distance is reduced, then it shows that there's loss of the radiolucent cartilage. So this is uh, another case of, uh, uh, you know, rheumatoid arthritis, metacarpophalangeal joint, you see erosions, but you don't see the cartilage at all. And of course, you know, hyperemia that we see over here. So that is joint space narrowing. Another patient, uh, similar to uh, the one which I showed you previously, uh, the distal radial ulnar joint, you see synovial hypertrophy, this marked dorsal uh, subluxation of the ulna, you see cortical erosions, you see tenosynovitis over here, effusion along with uh, some synovial hypertrophy and some osteophytes over here. So speaking about uh, tendon rupture, so what happens is chronic tenosynovitis, which causes uh, 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 chronic synovitis, chronic tenosynovitis, there's internal derangement of joints. So ultimately what happens is there's going to be, uh, uh, you know, alteration of the sliding of the tendons. And uh, so th uh, there are a couple of mechanisms which have been uh, suggested. So one is the attritional tear because like, you know, I said that the, uh, that the ulna goes up. So there's constant friction that we see. And the other uh, one that we see is, uh, which has been postulated is ischemia and ultrastructural changes in the tendon collagen due to, uh, you know, continuous synovitis. So, um, this is typically seen in rheumatoid patients. All right, you know, this kind of patient, they present with, uh, you know, this was referred by a hand surgeon. So, what we see is, you know, there was a finger drop of the ring and the little finger. And what we see is that there's a lot of swelling over here. Uh, so this was basically tenosynovitis, and there was a rupture of the uh, 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 of the compartment four tendon, which supplies to the little finger as well as the index finger. So what we uh, did is uh, basically they wanted pre-surgical uh, evaluation of the tendon just to mark where are the torn ends and what is the status of the synovial tissue. Another patient with a uh, lot of synovitis, uh, uh, you know, tenosynovitis, we see that this is a tendon and this is a uh, synovial tissue that we see over here. So the, uh, this is about the patient which I showed you uh, in the previous slide. What we see is an EDC tendon over here, and there's a discontinuity of the tendon and this proximal retraction, and this is the distance that we see between the two tendon torn ends. Another patient uh, uh, with scleroderma with tenosynovitis of the extensor compartment four tendons, you see fluid uh, synovial thickening, and uh, you don't see a tendon which is expected over here, and, uh, you know, when I do this video that we see, if you see, this is, these tendons are in continuity, but this tendon comes and there's discontinuity and this is the distal end. Again, as we see, you see this tendon appearing, it goes, the sudden cut off, then there's this tendon there. So this ultimately, the tenosynovitis, what are the criteria that we use for? Uh, so we obviously look at for reduction in the thickness of the panis. Uh, which is, uh, you look for synovial hypertrophy, which has gone down. You look for change in hyperemia, uh, which, you know, you adjust your power Doppler settings uh, that, you know, try and use the same what you had used uh, it for the uh, last examination. And uh, you look for reduction in the number of sequences uh, or, or the signals uh, that we had spoken about, that OMARAC grading. And of course, we look for erosions. Have they progressed? Have they become larger? Have they increased in size or not? So you look, uh, either you look at the, typical areas that have been recommended in literature or you look for any particular area that your uh, physician asks you to. So, uh, uh, for, uh, for example, if I, yeah, you know, this was a patient with, uh, 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 a patient with psoriasis who had presented with subacromial, sub, uh, subacromial subdeltoid bursitis. We see a lot of synovial hyperemia, uh, uh, hyperemia along with sy uh, synovial hypertrophy over here. So this was uh, the patient we had done in June after which the patient was injected, the bursa was injected, and uh, in August, when the patient came for a follow-up scan, there was no uh, effusion, and the bursitis had completely settled. Uh, in October, when the patient uh, came back, you know, there was, again, there was uh, fluid and uh, mild synovial thickening, which was there, and then the patient uh, refused any further injections, and we followed up the patient again in uh, uh, in uh, in November, and more or less the bursitis had remained unchanged. So that's how, how ultrasound is monitoring of the uh, patients. Uh, so uh, this is how uh, uh, you know we would want to use it in uh, practice, uh, pre-treatment and post-treatment, uh, since it's. Uh, 
uh, uh, you know, it's not that time consuming and maybe not that expensive. It, uh, it's uh, quite tolerable by the patient. The mis miscellaneous stuff, stuff that we would also look for is, uh, you know, I also uh, said that we would like to look at the subcutaneous tissues as well. So this was a dupuytren's nodule that we see uh, uh, in, a, uh, uh, in a patient with inflammatory arthropathy. This is a subcutaneous fat and this is a dupuytren's nodule which has come up. It has fairly non-specific features, uh, imaging features, but if you look at it at a proper site with, uh, uh, with your symptoms which fit into the picture yeah you know it, it fits into the di uh, diagnosis this was a patient with uh, ulcerative colitis who presented with uh, 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 an erythematous uh, le lesion uh, over the hand the uh, uh, the uh, the gastroenterologist was suspecting synovitis of the hand but then it just was uh, you know once you look at just uh, a subcutaneous edema with a lot of inflammation with uh, no effusion within the joint, it kind of fits it uh, fits into the erythema nodosum. Obviously, you don't make the diagnosis of erythema nodosum because it has non-specific findings. But then when you tell the this to the clinician, they would be able to put uh, everything into picture. Uh, you might have patients coming with, uh, you know, trigger fingers. So for trigger fingers, we typically look at, you know, A1 pulley thickening. So these are the, uh, this is a metacarpophalangeal joint and the long axis. These are the flexor tendons. Uh, this is uh, the A1 pulley, which is slightly thickened. And we use power Doppler to look for any hyperemia within the thickened pulley. So how do you know whether a pulley is thickened or not? You measure at the top of the pulley, you, if it's, you know, more than 1.1 millimeter in size, then think about uh, pulley thickening. Uh, and the best thing is to compare with either the contralateral finger or the uh, 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 either the contralateral side or the adjacent finger. However, uh, you know, a lot of times uh, the pulley might be normal in size, uh, in thickness, but, you know, the pa patient might still think about, uh, 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 might still give you the complaints of triggering. Look for if there's any underlying tenosynovitis as well. Another patient with erythema nodosum. So this is what erythema nodosum looks like. So the patients are typically sent to look for synovitis in the underlying joints, all right? So once you've ruled that out, you use really high resolution probes. So, all right, so this was, uh, 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 this was, you know, I spoke to you about, you know, using a large standoff pad or maybe be using a hockey stick probe. You see the subcutaneous tissue so well and you look at the hyperemia. It, uh, then, you know, it looks like, uh, uh, yeah, you can all, see, on ultrasound, you can just give it as maybe cellulitis or something, but then if the patient goes back to the physician or the experienced rheumatologist, they would know exactly what we're dealing with. Uh, some really uh, uh, amazing stuff you can do uh, with, you know, uh, high-resolution linear probes, maybe take your ultrasound imaging to the next level is, maybe you can have a look at the nails. So this is one patient with juvenile psoriatic arthropathy. You look at these typical changes in the nail. Uh, of course, you look at the nail, there are these certain uh, characteristic imaging features that, that we see. There's a dorsal and the ventral plate discontinuity that we see over here. So, and this is the nail bed. And uh, this is the uh, distal phalanx uh, of the great toe that we see. And of course, when we put on power Doppler, you see vascularity and it all fits so well. So that's where ultrasound is so good in inflammatory arthropathies. Now, this crystal deposition disease is a different entity altogether, and it's extremely, extremely common. You don't always need ultrasound to diagnose that. Uh, it's uh, a lot of times it's quite obvious on x-rays. So, but then what are the applications of ultrasound? So it basically, it, it picks up, uh, you know, intra-articular and periarticular crystal deposits, which are not visible on x-rays. You know, a lot of time these calcium or uh, these crystal deposits are radiolucent. These are, you know, amorphous deposits, which are not seen uh, on x-rays. So that's where ultrasound is so good. It tells you what is a uh, global crystal burden. It'll tell you that, okay, you know, this is a volume of crystal uh, uh, deposition. Is there a large chunk? Is there a small flake? Is there amorphous, uh, uh, you know, crystal deposit? Is it hard calcium? So all this will, uh, you know, you will be able to assess on ultrasound. And of course, diagnostic role, we've already spoken. 
So, uh, you know, there are basically two kinds of uh, crystal deposition disease. One is the gout, which consists of monosodium urate crystals. And then there's the other is CPPD, that is, uh, you know, calcium pyrophosphate deposition disease. All right. So these are the two big uh, crystal deposition diseases that we're talking about. So this is gout. A lot of us are aware of this typically presents on uh, the metatarsophalangeal joint of the great toe. However, uh, you know, if these tophi are not treated, so over a few years, three to five years, they keep on accumulating and they become huge gouty, uh, uh, you know, tophi. They almost become like pseudo masses over there. So, and uh, gout typically has a predilection for low, uh, lower limb in involvement, almost 85 to 90 percent of them. So, if you see over here, this is a long axis image, you see some, uh, you know, ill defined and heterogeneous echogenic soft tissue lesion, uh, you know, over the lateral alveolus not showing any vascularity and looks pretty much solid. So if you haven't seen the x-ray, you don't know the history, maybe you might feel maybe, you know, you're dealing with a, maybe a fibroma or something like that, a mesenchymal lesion. However, once you see this looks, uh, you look at the x-ray, you look at the history, things fit into the picture. So, all right, you know, it's a spot diagnosis. All right, you know, this is gout. You look at the CT of the same patient, large tongue sock, uh, uh, crystal depositions, uh, uh, crystal deposits that we see. The Achilles tendon, uh, knee extensors, and popliteus tendons are most commonly involved. Uh, you know, you, you get this classical uh, cartilage sign. Uh, you know, when there's intraarticular involvement, that means you know this crystal gets deposited over the surface of the cartilage, uh, and this is uh, this sign is seen on ultrasound pretty well. Or uh, sometimes when there is, you know, these crystals are diffusely scattered within the joint fluid. Uh, you know, you might see as uh, something like a snowstorm appearance over there. Coming to calcium pyrophosphate uh, deposition disease, unlike gout, it has slightly more predilection for the upper limb as well. So this is something that uh, we also we see quite often. So crystals are typically seen in articular or periarticular tissues over here. Uh, you know, its prevalence increases with age. In fact, a lot of patients, you know, they come for these. Uh, you know, x-rays, maybe of x-ray of chest or something, uh, ex uh, uh, maybe x-ray of the abdomen, you might see these crystal deposits. So these are more likely to be CPPD crystal deposition disease. Uh, chondrocalcinosis is something what when there's a lot of crystal deposition in the uh, uh, in the periarticular structures or within the calcium. So over here, this is a medial meniscus. You see entire uh, uh, you know, meniscus looks echogenic because of crystal deposition. And when you do an x-ray, this is what it looks like. This entire meniscus looks, uh, you know, uh, there's a lot of calcium over here. And if you look at it closely, there's deposition of, of crystals along the cartilage as well. So this is the femoral trochlear groove. You see over here that this crystal deposition. So uh, typically it involves knee, wrist, and hand. Um, so, uh, there are a lot of papers which actually say that ultrasound is highly sensitive and specific and even better than x-rays for uh, for diagnosis of crystal deposition disease or CPPD. So over here, this was one patient who came with acute pain over the thenar eminence. I was referred for an ultrasound for a possible abscess. So this is what we see. Uh, this is a metacarpophalangeal joint of the thumb. Uh, uh, you know, so this is a flexor pollicis longus tendon. You see some uh, two echogenic structures. Now, unfortunately, this can be really problematic. So this is a sesamoid bone and this was a calci uh, calcium deposit. And uh, uh, when you look, uh, when you put on power Doppler, you see a lot of hyperemia that we see over here. And of course, the uh, when you look at the X-ray, it gives you even more confidence to diagnose. So you see that these are the two sesamoid bones we see, and this is a calcium deposit, and this is uh, uh, extra, uh, you know, periarticular calcium deposition that we see, crystal deposition along the volar plate. Another patient, 27-year-old female with acute uh, pain along the ulnar You see a lot of uh, calcification just below the ECU. Uh, this is the extensor carpi ulnaris tendon on the short axis and a lot of hyperemia and power Doppler. And when you look on the long axis, you know that it's located right within the, within the TFCC. And on x-ray, it looks even more obvious. So this was typically CPPD that we already covered. This was another patient, acute pain along the volar aspect of the wrist. Uh, did not look like a carpal tunnel uh, disease on the clinical examination. So if you look at this, these are the flexor tendons. These are the volar recesses, and you see some crystal deposition. 
uh, on the short axis, we see the typical carpal tunnel, uh, uh, and this is the crystal deposition that we see over here, echogenic. And when you put on power Doppler, you see some amount of vascularity. Uh, you know, there was a lot of bleeding over here. But anyways, uh, uh, you know, it's indicated some amount of hyperemia. And when you have a look at it on x-rays, it is even more satisfying. So this was typical periarticular crystal deposition. Another patient, uh, uh, this was a patient known case of gout. So this patient presented with acute pain along the medial aspect of the knee. Uh, clinical suspicion was there of uh, gout. So what we see is uh, you see some amorphous calcification along the medial parapatellar recess, thickening synovium. And uh, we really weren't sure that is this a loose body or not. However, uh, you know, an MR was done just for academic reasons. And we see a crystal deposition with bone marrow edema along the medial femoral condyle. And of course, this is also uh, which is seen on uh, uh, which is seen on uh, CT as well. So uh, let's see on ultrasound alone, can we make a reasonable diagnosis of what kind of arthritis are we dealing with? So, uh, you know, if the patient has come with typical clinical features, high WBC count, acute pain, tenderness, uh, if there's subcutaneous edema, positive Doppler sign, then he might be dealing with septic arthritis. In fact, this is very commonly seen in patients, uh, you know, uh, who come with a diabetic foot. It's really difficult to, uh, diabetic foot or acute crystal deposition disease or cellulitis, are they dealing with septic arthritis or not? So that's where a lot of times we get these referrals for ultrasound. Um, if there is enthesitis, palma plate calcification, inflammation of the collateral ligament, and then think about either spondyloarthropathy, which is your HLA-B27 and psoriasis kind of arthritis. Um, we did not cover this because this is not possible to be diagnosed only with the, uh, by a radiologist. But then, you know, it's like if the patient's age is more than 50 years, bilateral shoulder and hip findings and no, no wrist synovitis, no wrist. All right, think about polymyalgia, rheumatica. Suppose you find synovitis, then what do you think of? If there's symmetric joint distribution, erosion, tenosynovitis, think about RA. So I'm using this words, think about RA, because it's not just imaging alone. There's a whole uh, battery of, uh, you, you know, serological tests and clinical evaluation that needs to be done. Uh, all right, before labeling a patient as a certain kind of an inflammatory arthropod. If there's asymmetric joint distribution, double contour, hyperechoic aggregates, think about gout, uh, chondrocalcinosis, tendon calcification, think about CPPD. And this is something which uh, maybe I should have uh, addressed right early. If you see marginal osteophytes, the first thing, think about osteoarthritis, all right? So even osteoarthritis can be complicated by a crystal deposition disease as well. So you can have acute on chronic osteoarthritis as well. So once you're done with diagnosis, what more can you offer uh, to the rheumatologists? So you can do intraarticular and periarticular therapeutic injections. You can do diagnostic aspirations. Uh, you can do therapeutic aspirations because a lot of times we require to differentiate between infection and inflammation and uh, synovial biopsies, not very commonly done, but this is what we something what we've been doing a lot of research on. Uh, so this was a patient with uh, psoriasis. What we see is the patient has come with shoulder pain. Uh, you see, uh, 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 you know, prominent effusion in the subacromial subdeltoid bursa on the axial as well as the coronal images. And what we do is uh, put in the needle and, uh, you know, you inject a steroid over there. So if you're beginning, you would really uh, want, uh, you know, you would really wish that you get such a nice uh, juicy bursa to start with, you know, just to inject and it's absolutely safe. A uh, patient with a uh, 60-year-old female with heel pain, patient had, uh, you know, uh, Achilles ten, uh, some degree of tendinosis with a more, some amount of retrocalcaneal bursitis. You see a lot of hyperemia uh, within the bursa. So what you can do is, you know, where these places were require really small footprint, use a hockey stick probe. So this is uh, what we did. You put in a needle and make sure that you don't inject into the Achilles tendon, all right? So this is what we're doing injecting right within the retrocalcaneal bursa. That's the needle. Uh, this was a patient, you know, I had shown it one of the earliest slides. This was a patient with scleroderma uh, with a lot of wrist swelling. There was a clinical suspicion of 
uh, of tuberculosis, uh, tuberculosis stenosynovitis. So what you can do is just uh, put in uh, a large bow needle, aspirate. Uh, you can get tissue for culture, and uh, this turned out to be staph aureus. And uh, yeah, so uh, we had a diagnosis there. Another patient, uh, you know, had already shown you a large Baker cyst. So these kind of huge Baker cysts, you know, they might make a uh, you know, difficult for flexion of the legs. So what the patient can do is they can, uh, uh, what uh, the radiologist can do is you can put in the needle, aspirate the fluid. If required, we can as well. So this was the aspirate fluid, aspirated fluid. We almost aspirated 800 ml of fluid. And along with the fluid, what these, uh, you know, these nodular uh, deposits uh, are like, you know, these structures that we see over here. This is, uh, you know, sh uh, synovium which has been uh, shedding over the period of time. So this was aspirated fluid in a patient with rheumatoid uh, arthritis. Um, synovial biopsies. Uh, this was a patient, 72 year old female uh, with painful right shoulders in six months. Uh, he had a query history of rheumatoid arthritis. Again, somebody raised a suspicion of tuberculosis. So uh, you see market thickening in the subacromial subdeltoid bursa along with the joint. So a lot of hyperemia on uh, in the subacromial subdeltoid bursa. So what we do is we put in the needle and we take a sample from the tissue, from the thickened tissue. And this is what we did. Uh, the patient turned not to be negative for tuberculosis, and it was a, some kind of a chronic inflammatory arthritis. So this is the needle which goes in through which we insert the portal, uh, through which we insert the forceps and take a uh, biopsy. Another 27-year-old female with painful swelling in the left knee. Uh, again, clinical suspicion of tuberculosis. Uh, through the portal, we in introduce our forceps and we try and uh, retract uh, you know, we try and grasp the synovium and retract the synovium. And this is what we get, nice pearly synovium. Uh, but this patient too turned out to be negative for tuberculosis. So you all, apart from just the fluid, you also have a histopathological diagnosis. So what are the limitations of ultrasound? You can't detect bone inflammation. So that's where MRI really scores, uh, uh, as, as scores uh, over ultrasound. There is obviously there's inter-observer variability, but as long as we follow the OMARAC classifications and guidelines, it's really going to be much more easier for us to do that. We're going to uh, bring down the inter-observer variability. Equipment with variable quality, yes, that is a little bit of an issue, uh, but then uh, I think over the period uh, you know, of time, I think we will overcome uh, that aspect as well because we're getting better and better machines, which are becoming more and more sensitive for color, uh, power Doppler signals and better probes, all right? So we never speak about the, uh, uh, the increased resolution of the probes, and so even that factor as well. So the take-home points are that ultrasound has a high sensitivity in detection of soft tissue inflammation. It has been, ultrasound has been proven beyond doubt how important it is in the management of inflammatory arthropathies. Now, let me tell you, a lot of uh, radiologists don't know about this because a lot of work is being done by rheumatologists. Let me tell you, you go up and read up. There, if, uh, you know, there are like five articles in, uh, in radiology, there'll be maybe a hundred articles on musculoskeletal ultrasound in rheumatology. So they are far more aware, uh, the rheumatologists, and they're already doing quite a bit of it. So it's about time we go ahead and we join the party. So appropriate probe selection, and you ensure optimum machine settings. That's absolutely essential. It's easier to detect early osseous erosions in hands and feet. And um, it, it is an ideal imaging modality in detection of tendon pathology in wrists, hands, ankle, and feet. So uh, these are some of my last thoughts, you know, as we uh, go ahead, uh, as I finish my lecture. So, you know, most of us have been brought up, uh, you know, having a look at this x-ray. So, okay, let me tell you, all the three x-rays belong to patients with rheumatoid arthritis. And, uh, you know, in our PG days, we see this and we say, oh, yeah, that's a spot. That's a rheumatoid arthritis. But uh, in today's era... All right, so I feel that if you diagnose rheumatoid arthritis at this stage, maybe, you know, somewhere the patient has, or we as a radiologist, we have missed the bus. The patient has already developed osteoarthritis, contractures, deformities. So what we should try and do is try and intervene at this stage, or maybe at this stage, so that rheumatoid arthritis does not progress to this stage. 
So with this, I think uh, this long talk uh, is, uh, you know, we bring an end to this. And sure, uh, let me know if there are any questions. I'll be happy to answer. All right. Thank you so much.